that the Apostle Paul teaches that God elects people based on his foreknowing who will choose him. That he looks down the corridor of time and determines who is going to believe and who is not going to believe, and then elects people based on that kind of foreknowledge. If that's what Paul was teaching, this question and the question in verse 14 would never and could never have been raised. But the fact that these questions are being raised of the Apostle Paul is evidence of the fact that Paul teaches that God is sovereign in election and it has absolutely nothing to do with man. He has mercy on whom he will have mercy and he hardens whom he will harden. The doctrine of election and reprobation has been clear here. Remember, reprobation is the idea of God passing over some. And electing others. It is not as though God has to make people sinful. Man is born in sin. Every human being on planet earth. Born with a sinful nature. Which by the way. And we've said this before. And I'll probably say it again. This is why the virgin birth is not something that we can give up on. Because it is the virgin birth that separates Christ from original sin. So those out there who argue, well, it doesn't really matter, all of the technical stuff, as long as you just believe in Jesus. No. If you believe that Jesus was not virgin born, then you believe that Jesus had a sin nature. And if you believe that Jesus had a sin nature, then you must also believe that his death would not be sufficient to cover the sins of other sinners because he would have had to pay for his own sin and therefore have been unable to pay for yours. The virgin birth matters. Doctrine matters. And so man is born in sin. Man is shaped in iniquity. And the doctrine of reprobation is simply this. God passes over some and elects others for salvation. And our question ought not be, how dare God save some and not others? Our question ought instead to be, how could God save me? Why would God save any of us? But the reason we don't ask that question is because we think too much of ourselves. And that's right to where Paul goes. Who do you think you are? And the answer is, we think we're the center of the universe. That's the answer. Listen to this from James Montgomery Boyce. He puts an even finer point on the matter. But now the wicked resourcefulness of the human heart comes in. For if a person cannot deny God's sovereignty over human affairs and human destinies, or even God's right to save some and pass over others, as God does, the person will at last try to deny his or her own responsibility in the matter. If I can't get at this angle and attack the sovereignty of God, if I cannot attack God's right to pass over some and to save others, and I have to acknowledge God's sovereignty, then the next way for me to alleviate, alleviate this pressure that is upon me, because I don't want to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, the next way for me to alleviate that pressure is to question God's justice and to question my own responsibility or accountability for my sin. And therein lies this question that Paul faces, and that you and I will face as we talk to people about the doctrines of grace. If you talk to people about the doctrine of God's sovereign electing grace, this question is going to arise. But here's the pressure that you feel when the question arises. The, question, the pressure that you feel is to defend God. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Because people are basically saying that God's a big meanie and he's not fair. And we feel like we have to defend God. So we go round and round and round trying to defend God so that God doesn't look to them as a big meanie. Whereas Paul looks him square in the face and says, who do you think you are? Well, but I could never do that. Why? Well, I could never do that because the person wouldn't be satisfied with that response. And the Lord knows I live for the satisfaction of other people. Oh, I could never say that, because if I said that, then the person might harden their heart and God might not be able to save them. Let me see if I get this straight. 
if you are pressing the point of God's sovereign election and salvation, and somebody gets offended by you pressing the point of God's sovereign election and salvation, then you're afraid that somehow God won't be able to sovereignly elect them because you offended them. That dog won't hunt. Paul's response is important. And he is not merely trying to be offensive. Let's examine his response more carefully. His response is all about contrast. The first contrast, you are man and not God. Newsflash. Look at me if you will. There in verse 19. You will say to me then, who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Now in the Greek, this is even more poignant. Because in the Greek, there is a definite article here. And so, basically, he's saying, who are you, man, to answer back to not just God, but the God? You are a man. He is the God. There is but one God. And he's not you. Who are you to answer back to God? Don't move past that too quickly. Because here's part of our problem with the sovereignty of God and election. Part of our problem with the sovereignty of God and election is that we think too much of ourselves. I would say we think too much of mankind, but that's really not the case. I don't think too much of mankind. I just think too much of me. I think more of myself than I do of anyone else. And it's really not a problem for me that God has not explained himself to you. It's a problem that he hasn't explained himself to me. Can I get a witness? The problem is, I think too much of me. And I think God owes it to me to explain himself at every step. And even beyond that, I think God owes it to me to explain to my satisfaction at every step what it is that he does. And even beyond that, I think God owes it to me to explain to my satisfaction everything that he does. And if I don't like it. It's incumbent upon him to fix it so that I do. That's what I think of me. And more correctly, that's how little I think of God. That's what you think of you. And that's how little you think of God. You know, our problem with the doctrine of election is not that Romans 9 is unclear. It's that we think it unkind. Our problem with the doctrine of election is not that Romans 9 is somehow confusing or cloudy. The problem is it's not what you would do. That's our problem. And that is why Paul goes to the heart of the issue in asking, in essence, who do you think you are? You are a man. He is the God of the universe. There is a distance between you that is unfathomable. He is independent. And unmade. You are created. God is immutable. And you are ever changing. God is eternal. And you are temporal. God is omnipotent and you are frail and weak. God is omnipresent. And you are finite. God is holy. And you are sinful. And you dare question God. Who do you think you are? The psalmist writes in Psalm 115.3, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Again, Psalm 135.6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. So again, who do you think you are? You don't, you don't even like this. Some of you are uncomfortable because I keep asking you that question. Because you just think that that's just not the way. That someone ought to respond. You just think that maybe it's not pastoral. Maybe it's not godly to get in someone's face and say, who do you think you are when they question God? The only way that that's not godly is if it's not something that God himself would condone or if it's not something that God himself would do. Go to Job 38 with me for a moment, please. Job's had some difficulties, shall we say, in his life. He and his friends are trying to figure things out theologically. Job comes to a place where he forgets himself. 
questions God. And in Job 38, not only in Job 38, but in Job 38, God begins to respond. Let's listen to how this loving God responds to being challenged and questioned by finite man. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when it made clouds its garment and fit darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the sea, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, and walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. And he continues and continues and continues and continues. And in essence, he looks Job in the face and says, Who do you think you are? I'm God. I answer to no one. And if this answer bothers you, hear me when I say, you think too much of yourself. If this answer bothers you, Hear me when I say, you do not reverence and worship the God of the universe the way you ought to. If this answer does not suffice for you, be afraid. Be very afraid. Because you dare challenge the God of the universe. And he will not share his glory with another. And he will not have his decrees challenged by those who borrow the very breath that they use to speak to him. He is God, and you are not. That's his first response. Secondly, you are creature, not creator. You are creature, not creator. Look as he continues in Romans 9. Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? God created you. You did not create God. God is not a figment of your imagination. God is the one who created the world, and he's the one who created you. So first of all, he's God, and you're not. Secondly, he created you, and not the other way around. Think about this before you go questioning God. Think about this before you lay charge against God, because something doesn't agree with you, or doesn't sit right with you. God created you. That means first, that you exist for God's purposes. You exist for God's purposes. You do not exist at your own pleasure. You do not exist for your own purposes. Nor do you get to determine the purpose for which you exist. God has determined the purpose for which you exist. And the shorthand answer is, the purpose for which you exist is the glory of God, however He chooses to glorify Himself in and with and through your life. Therefore, you owe God worship and obedience. You owe God worship and obedience. Nothing else makes sense from the perspective of the creature toward the Creator.